la di la di la di la. School of school of school of schools. <laughs> University of the Underground. From the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam. The subject this week is reverse engineering economic mania. Join us in rehearsing alternative economic models in preparation for the end of the world. From 30th October till 3rd of November at Istanbul Design Biennale. Live radio broadcast worldwide every day at 5 p.m. in Istanbul. That's 2 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. It's happening. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the School of School of Schools radio show. We are, uh, yeah, we are proud uh, to be part of the Istanbul Design Biennial. Um, we are the University of the Underground, and we are broadcasting live from Art Art Gallery in Istanbul. Um, we are here to discuss and research alternatives for our economy. So my name is Tern Kastelijn. I'm a tutor at the University of the Underground, and I'm here with my colleague, Hello, good afternoon. I was going to give us a bit more uh, context. Hi, thank you, Turn. Um, so I'm going to introduce the project, which is called Reverse Engineering Economic Mania. That's a real mouthful, but I'm going to explain quickly what we've been doing since the beginning of September. This project looks particularly at the shared history between uh, Turkey, Istanbul in particular, and Amsterdam. And what we came across was the story of the tulip. So tulips were traded between the Netherlands and Istanbul as early as the 1600s and came originally from Turkey. And of course, all of you know how tulips have become synonymous with the, ne the Netherlands and Dutch tourism. Um, eventually, what happened in the 1600s was that tulips became so valuable and sought after that uh, the first financial bubble was created. And the price of tulips went up enormously, meaning that they were more valuable than a canal house. So the Netherlands also is very well known as being the home of the multinational corporation. And where the first financial share was actually sold. So our students have been looking into this shared connection between Turkey and the Netherlands, and today we'll present to you some of their results. We went on several field trips during the preparation for this project. We went to the Dutch Bank in Amsterdam, where there's a large collection of real gold. There is also the Dutch Stock Exchange, which we first visited. Um, the first sorry, the first stock exchange in the world. We also visited the largest um, exchange for flowers globally, which is also based in the Netherlands. Today, we're gonna to share with you some of the research that the students have come up with so far. We have an umbrella structure called the School of School of Schools. And today, we present you with the School of Hidden Influences. Throughout the week, we're presenting our other schools. There's the School of Influence, the School of Individuals, the School of the Invisible, the School of Value, and the School of Consumption. So we invite you to join us and listen to how the students have looked at the, the existing economic models and been able to come up with their own alternatives, their own imaginations about economic models. So that's it from us. We are the tutors, but we're now handing over to the students because from now on, students are teachers. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but let us short introduce uh, today. There we have uh, Joseph Please, who is going to talk about shadow banking. Ada Reintal on communism. Uh, that's not communism, but it's communism. Well, Ada will, it's with an O instead of a U. Uh, Ada will explain more about it and Male, Malena Arcucci on economics and language and how political speeches influence the financial situation of her nation. She's from Argentina. All right, uh, Joseph, you're more than welcome to join us here in the show. So 
sorry, I'm just gonna have to set up my laptop very quickly. Cool, okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, so my name's Joseph, please. And uh, so like Ten said, I'm gonna be talking about shadow banking. So I'm gonna have to explain that quickly first. So this is uh, East Wenatchee in Washington in America. And what you're looking here is a satellite image of uh, BlackRock server farms. So I'm guessing most of you haven't heard of BlackRock before. And BlackRock are the world's largest uh, asset management corporation. So what they do is they work on behalf of large corporations and manage their, their capital to create more capital. So they do this by investing in stocks or in architecture or in many other trust funds. Uh, they currently manage $6.3 trillion of assets, which is about 8% of the world's global wealth. Uh, but through their software, they also manage $23 trillion, which is much more onwards of 23%. Um, so they're a really significant force in the global economy. And uh, essentially, if you're not in finance, they're kind of invisible. So I'm going to explain first a bit more about them, then I'll go into how I became interested in them. So uh, BlackRock was founded in 1988. And like I said, they manage a lot of assets. And most of these assets uh, come in the form of pensions. So that's lots of police officers' pensions, nurse pensions. Most people's pensions are put into these funds, which are then put into the hands of BlackRock to try and create more wealth. And it does this by looking through mass amounts of data and analyzing that to try and predict what the market is going to do. Uh, so it has a huge amount of computing power as you can see behind me, that's dedicated towards essentially predicting the future of the economy and ensuring that people's money grows. Um, but the way in which that money is used is sort of uh, at the hands of algorithms and isn't really decided. It can go into arms, it can go into uh, nuclear weapon development, it can go into like organic farming development. It's really up to the computer to decide about any level of morality. Um, so it also has a lot of shares in huge amounts of infrastructure, especially in Europe. So a lot of the energy corporations, a lot of the democracies are con have huge amounts of BlackRock assets sat inside of them. So they do control unknowingly a huge amount of uh, global in in infrastructure, essentially. Um, so yeah, and the reason I'm interested in them is because of the AI at the center of BlackRock that controls it, which is a program called Aladdin. And the reason I was interested in this was because I was looking originally at this book, Red Star, by Alexander Bogdanov. So Bogdanov was uh, one of Lenin's friends from 1909, and he that's when this book was published. And he was interested in a workers' revolution and a Bolshevik revolution, and he thought that for that to happen, the workers need to work uh, in unison with technology, which Lenin disagreed with. And kicked him out of the party. As a response, Bogdanov wrote this book, Red Star, in which a worker gets transmitted to Mars into a society of Martians who are all controlled by a central computer that enables communism to work perfectly. Um, and, and that's kind of a really interesting idea in 1909 where the idea that technology or computing could somehow bring about an economic ideology. And then this came into real, real form later on, about 50 years later, Oh, actually, seven, 60 years later, in Chile. So this is Project Cybersyn. So for people on the radio, you're looking at a room that looks like a James Bond set. And essentially, this was a real computer that was used to predict the input and output of factories in Chile to sort of manage resources. And this was shut down very, very quickly by parts of the Chilean government, and it never really succeeded any further than a two-year stint, in which it was very successful. But then we move on to now, and to 1988 until now, we have BlackRock, which I'm super interested in because it essentially adopts the same ideas. It adopts this idea of a centralized computer system to control the economy, but it's done it on a very different terms under like an ideology of neoliberalism. So this computer system uh, operates and all the time running about 24% of the global wealth. And it does it through a series of insanely complex algorithms and data that's driven in from stock prices to uh, political situations, and it runs these algorithms through and ensures that it can carry on working. So what's really interesting is that it's a company that's one of the only companies in finance that has done really well after the financial crash, because it, the government bonds had to be bought up by someone, and they were bought up by BlackRock. So this is how BlackRock doubled in infrastructure in about two years' time. So that's where that sits. So, sorry, I'm going to have to look at my notes very quickly. 
So, I, yeah, I was really interested in Aladdin, the AI that runs with it, and I was trying to figure out how that works. And it works through a lot of complicated algorithms, but its base form is something called the Monte Carlo simulation. So I was going about trying to figure out how that worked. So if I throw this across here, you can see. This is my own version of the Monte Carlo simulation, which I coded. And it's a little bit complicated. But essentially, what it does, this is BlackRock's stock. And it predicts the future of the stock millions and millions of times and takes the average of those. So what you're looking at here is a simulation of 1,000 years of BlackRock's uh, stock price uh, overlaid on e each other. Um, and the way it does this is by looks at the stock price of all of BlackRock stocks ever. And then it looks at the, how much it changes from day to day and times that by a random amount and does that so many times that it can predict. It's essentially the equivalent of if you flip a coin once and it's heads, that means if you're compu to a computer, it would be heads every time because the, the test sample has only done once and it's 100% heads. But if you flip it twice, then you've got heads and tails. But if it's heads and heads again, then it's, the computer still thinks it's got a 100% chance of always landing on heads. So you do that a million times, and eventually you're going to get a more likely scenario for what the result of flipping a coin is. And that's essentially what the Monte Carlo simulation does with stock prices. It just keeps guessing over and over again until the likelihood of something happening is, is feathered out amongst the amount of times it tries. So it does this. BlackRock does this all the time and tries to predict, thing, uh, try to predict the stock and move things around. So I found that, one, slightly problematic because, um, it's, I mean, it's all, economics has always been a, ga a guessing game, but this is a very real guessing game. And two, I found it super interesting as well, so I sort of caught up by that. So I wanted to explore this uh, in a piece of artwork, essentially, or a project. So what I ended up with actually was uh, this. And I'll try and explain it now, hopefully, as I maneuver the thing behind me. So if I reset this, hopefully it works. Ooh. So everyone can see this? OK, great. So let me explain what this piece of work is. So this is a, originally I wanted to do this on an LED sign, and I was looking all around Istanbul to see where I could find one in time, but I didn't have enough time, so I've simulated it here. What this is, is the definition of shadow banking run through the stock uh, market API for BlackRock. So what's happening here is that I'm looking every five minutes at the stock price of BlackRock and seeing whether so I'm updating that live, and at the same time, I'm simulating BlackRock stock price through their own API. So I'm using BlackRock's own software to predict where, what the stock price of BlackRock stock will be. And then if it's correct, then the, the, the simulation recognizes that correct, and if it's incorrect, it recognizes it as wrong. So at the moment, BlackRock is wrong. Like, in the past five minutes, it guessed its own stock price incorrectly. So that kind of shows some of the disingenuity in the, in the project. But also, it, it, to be real, like it dropped by 0.53%. So th these things are so minute. But yeah, it, this is what I was interested in. So yeah, it's, uh, I, and I was really in, intrigued by how quickly I was able to utilize this software myself. And I thought it would be interesting to see whether if this technology of high finance and high-end neoliberalism was taken away from huge stock assets, but actually put into the hands of like mass people. Would that change the economy? So instead of trying to like find a solution out of it, more hand the technology over to like everyone within it. Um, so I have no idea what would happen <laughs> if I did that, and I probably should not do that. But it is a possibility that everyone has the ability to do, and I find that sort of an interesting proposition. And. I think that brings me to the end, which is five minutes of questions, if you like. There we go. Um, hopefully that made sense. Are there any questions for Josef? Because I didn't understand anything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't grasp it, everything, okay. indeed. Um, Anybody question before I start? No? Um, so what you've created is, uh, is responding on the, on the shares of 
uh, BlackRock? Yeah, so essentially it's sort of like a lie detector, I guess, where it's predicting, it's predicting the future of BlackRock stock five minutes ahead. <laughs> and then if it's correct or not, it will affect on here. So as you see on the screen, we've got a countdown which has just gone through. So at the moment, in four minutes and 20 seconds, it will check again to see whether the stock price it has predicted it should have in five minutes is correct or not. Okay, and it's your own algorithm that you created? Yeah, this is a very basic version of BlackRock's algorithm, but mm -hmm. actually BlackRock do have their code accessible, but they won't give it to me because I'm not part of BlackRock. But if, you're, if you take part in one of their hackathons or something, you could probably get access to it. So since uh, BlackRock is fully functioning on algorithms, you decided to create an algorithm expecting what the uh, shares of BlackRock will do. Yeah, it's kind of a weird loophole. Or yeah, it's kind of a loophole. All right. Um, still, no questions? No, no, no questions. Cool. Okay. <laughs> but you were stating at the end, you were stating that if everybody would be capable of using the BlackRock algorithm, then what? I think I was just interested to see where um, essentially BlackRock have 6.3 trillion dollars of assets. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's a huge amount of sway. That's 8% of the world's global capital that they have the ability to move around and decide where it goes. And as you know, and you, we know what happens if you invest, on, and you invest in arms, then you're, you can make more guns. If you invest in wind farms, you can make more wind farms. That's mm -hmm. a huge uh, shift like globally in terms of technology and development and the way so uh, societies are structured. Um, yeah. And if one company has access to that thing, that's... Uh, Essentially, it's like a, it's almost, it's, it's unheard of. It's kind of crazy that this is happening. But so you want to, you want to democratize BlackRock? Kind of. I guess the idea is that if that same 6.3, 6.3 trillion dollars of assets is spread into six billion people, which would never happen, but that that disrupts that as a force that's that can t that can hold that much money. All right. <laughs> Um, uh, the next uh, speaker is going to be Mala or Ada? Ada? Thank Are you, you ready? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Joseph. and here in this room. Uh, my name is Ada Reintal, and uh, I'll start with a little bit of a background. Whoops, actually. Um, last night, we did this really interesting workshop where we kind of looked at our expectations of this design course prior to coming, um, and then sort of compared that to where we are at now. And Looking back, I realized that one of the reasons that I wanted to do this course was that it's so multidisciplinary. And because I had a background both in um, a lot of years ago working as a technician, setting up all these kind of systems that we're using today, um, but also I worked in film and TV, I wanted to sort of combine those two and get back into this like live event sort of space. So it's, it's really great to be back here and um, I'm going to be talking about um, my research which uh, for this project looking at economics I started by 
looking at the last 10 years worth of um, Nobel Prizes in economics, and the one that really stood up to me was the one that was awarded to Eleanor Ostrom in 2008, which is the year after the infamous financial crisis. And her research is, um, was looking into, um, we're trying to, this is idea called um, the tragedy of the commons, that that which is owned by all is cared for by none. Um, and she wanted to sort of disprove this because uh, she found empirically that there was a lot of different situations where, where's that sound coming from? Uh, <laughs> uh, where this wasn't true. So, for instance, with a lot of, <coughs> is that what's going on here? Sorry. Maybe I'll try this mic instead. Um. Hello. <laughs> um, about two feet to the right for you on the radio that didn't see that. Um, so yeah, Eleanor Ostrom was researching commons and um, various types of resource pools that were governed by the users. So one example is like um, grazing with cattle, um, the old traditional system where you just have a bunch of people kind of having figured out how to do this, how to share this grazing land, actually worked a lot better than market mechanisms or um, like state controlled centralized systems. So that was my starting point. And along the way, I've realized that now, 10 years later, this is to some extent developed into a bit of a movement. And I went to a symposium or a public tribunal looking into the precarious conditions of workers within the cultural sphere. And there was a speaker there called uh, Lara Garcia Diaz who's been researching this is um, actually her PhD. And she wrote a few articles in a book that I bought. So I'm gonna read the intro, or a segment from the intro. Um, let me just find the page. So this book is called Communism. That's communism with an O in the middle not a U in the middle. Um, communism, a new aesthetics of the real. <clears throat> and I quote, every ideology is good at hiding the fact that it is one. That's what makes it an ideology. To paraphrase Mark Fisher, Every ideology claims realism. So it claims that it is not an ideology, not a belief system, no full co false consciousness, but reality. Just the way things work and just the way things are. Communism, the one that I'm not talking about, was an ideology. Fascism was one also. Neoliberalism certainly is one. And probably most religions function like one. They are all aesthetics of the real. Ideologies are performances of reality in name of what is real. But the real is unspeakable. It lies under the radar of the symbolic order, as we know from Jacques Lacan. Everyone's read Lacan, right? Um, the real functions as viscerality in decision-making processes in social relationships. We know it is there, that it is real, and we know it influences our perception and even our judgments of others 
but we do this without any rational ground. And it is no different for the ideology that is the central theme of this book and my research for this project. After half a century of neoliberalism, we are well excited to welcome a new belief system, the commons. So what is this belief about? Well, we believe that social relationships can replace money or contract relationships. We certainly believe that we need more solidarity. And some of us think that economy sucks, while others believe only this economy sucks. Um, so, yeah. Um, so what actually is communism and what are these commoning practices? Well, I'm sure that most people have um, accessed Wikipedia or some sort, some version of that. Um, so that's a commoning practice within the um, sphere of knowledge production, I guess, or spreading. Um, but you could also like, you can look at the difference between what's in the public domain and what's um, within the commons, uh, because the public domain is open to everyone and everything. Whereas when you have a, a, a commoning practice or some kind of commons that is open to a select few without restrictions, but open to the general public with some restrictions. Unlike traditional copyright, which has the little classical all rights reserved, this has some rights reserved. And, um, yeah, so what, why do people collectivize? Why do they come together and create these common resource pools within the cultural sphere? Well, um, it's because of this, um, the way that the, the cultural sphere functions today, it's, you need to be very um, like highly flexible while at the same time being able to do everything um, you know, as a designer, for instance, um, my housemaid, um, Buzra, uh, who I'm staying with here in Istanbul, she's currently working on two exhibitions as a designer, but she's doing, like, everything, from designing the flyers to the posters to actually designing the space to editing some of the videos within that space. So we're kind of being overworked in this kind of very precarious conditions. And this really takes a toll on, on you as a person, like not just because you might have an overload of work at one point and then no work for a long time, but it also takes a toll on your social relationships. Um, and in the long term, really has a negative effect on your mental health. So that's, at least in my opinion, bad. Um, some people really, I guess, flourish in this sort of attention economy. Um, they're really made out to be thought leaders or social media influencers because it's not really about expertise. It's about marketing an idea. And a lot of people find that problematic, as myself included. Um, but in order to protect against this kind of precarious nature within the cultural sphere, some people come together and they create collectives or some kind of commons. Um, one example is a autonomous space in Milan called Macau, and they were talking about, it's not just because of, you know, housing markets everywhere, there's no space, advertising is just creeping into every corner of our existence, you know, you get little pop-up ads on your phone, <laughs> you know, when you're scrolling your friend's social feeds, or you're sitting at a public toilet and there's an ad in front of you. 
uh, yeah, it's not just about claiming space, but about claiming time. Because um, when you're designing two exhibitions and then you're applying for that other exhibition on the other side of the world or in, um, like we're right now here in Istanbul, even though we're based in Amsterdam, um, it's, um, wow, I totally lost my train of thought there. But anyway, the example that I'm, I want to talk about the most is pub TV. So right now, we're not just streaming this uh, through the radio, but also through Twitch. Um, and I'm part of a publishing platform that is a self-organized student initiative at our school, the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam. And what we're really trying to do is to build a platform that we can pass on to the next generation of students, because now we're, we're in the second year, next year we'll be gone. Um, so we're trying to set up a system that can keep going without us. And I think that's at the core of a lot of commoning practices. Um, how am I doing for time? Thank you, Ada, for sharing your thoughts. I want to, do you have something else to add? Okay, Ada, your closing statements. Let's go for it. Sorry, I went on some diatribes there. I usually do. But yeah, so um, Pub um, started as a radio channel. We also have a journal that I've been part of. Um, and we're just now this year setting up this TV channel. And this is our first broadcast. So yeah, we're learning as we go. And that's the point with these commoning practices, is learning as you go and trying to write the rules for the next generations and trying to like workshop them as they go. So yeah, that's the long-term goals. And as a closing statement, I'd like to read another passage from this book. So, through aesthetics, ideology shapes our reality. The aesthetics of the commons is an aesthetics that is not imposed from the top down but rises from the bottom, up from the communi. What is clear is that aesthetics cannot be claimed individually, but only as part of a collective, co-creative process in which ultimately any commoner can claim authorship. Communal practices are precarious um, and extremely sensitive to recapitulation, gentrification, privatization, privatization, commodification, but even to nationalization. In order to survive in the long run, communal practice had therefore best remain invisible, secret, or clandestine. Commoners initiate processes and push the world in a specific direction, but they do so in the hope that others will appropriate take over and continue these processes. Stealthy, slumbering, underground, and under the skin. These are the characteristics by which an ideology spreads and persuades the best. It's called poetica. Thanks. I have a quick question for you. Yes. Where do we find Pub Radio? What's um, the domain that we can go to? Pub Radio, you find at pub.samberg.nl. We've just kind of revamped the website and we're still working on it, like any things of these sorts. They're, um, um, yeah, works in progress. Yeah, and that's run entirely by students? Yeah. Students from the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, so we're all putting in our time and whatever resources we can. Um, okay, super. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on communism with us. 
Um, I'm wondering if there are any thoughts from the audience, questions so far? No? Okay, shall we go to our next host cool. of the School of Influencers? Male, where are you? Oh. My name is Malena, and as Joseph mentioned, or Ten maybe, at the beginning of this uh, broadcast, um, I researched the effect of political speech uh, in the context of an economic crisis, uh, and taking the case study of uh, Argentina, so I am Argentinian. Um, I found this well, funny uh, comparison. Tomás Rodríguez León argues that the doctor and the politician share the same semantic resources. Uh, they both impose tru uh, truth uh, and are in charge of the diagnosis and the prognosis. Uh, the acceptance of their speech will always be mediatized, passively or aggressively, by the degree of trust on the speaker. Uh, rehabilitation and change are uh, then in the hands of the patient of, uh, or the citizen uh, to bring into effect. Um, and the idea of change um, as a key concept present in every single political speech in Argentina. Uh, you could say that Argentina is in a constant state of economic mania, and, I, and mania is, by definition, linked to madness and unrest. Um, so I would I argue uh, that the Argentinian politician shares linguistic resources with the psychiatrist rather than the clinical doctor. Uh, in our 200 years as a republic, we have managed to go from being one of the richest countries in the world to having one of the five most fragile and unstable economies in the world. It is not easy to point at a cause. Uh, some people argue um, that it's due to the implementation of short-term economic policy, some that Argentina is yet to determine whether it, ha it will have a system that prioritizes export and foreign trade or national industry and internal economy. Uh, the price of the American dollar has always acted as a thermometer of, an economic, of our economic situation. Uh, we generally follow a pattern. We go through periods of uh, euphoria and global positioning, then dollarization because of ex um, foreign um, imports, uh, then overspending, then deficit, then rise in the price of the dollar again, panic, inflation, economic crisis, and foreign debt. Uh, so I'm gonna start in the 1980s. Uh, so a conservative government empowers the agrarian, con uh, the agrarian sector controlled by an oligarchy of European immigrants and positions Argentina as a granary of the world. The country becomes one of the richest economies in the world. The modelo de exportador requires the devaluation of the peso to encourage foreign investments, foreign debt, the slogan, cultivar el suelo es servir a la patria. The economic crash in America in 1930 means that the trade deals are made void. Cutting public spending, fuga de capitales y recesión. 1930, chaos, social unrest, and coup. Please be patient, they said. Things will change. 1943, 
chaos, social unrest, and coup. After 130 years of, ec of economic policy directed at the higher classes and focused on foreign markets and exports, Juan Domingo Perón established an interventionist government. They buy public services from Britain, uh, national industry grows, and so do worker unions. Change is happening. Please be patient, they said. We can do this together. Policies of full employment and the standardization of salaries, protectionist measures, subsidies and low interest loans, and the financing of inflation, nationalization of central bank, uh, low results, and general overspending. Chaos, social unrest, and coup. Please be patient, they said. Keep calm. Second round, third round. Chaos, social unrest, coup. The coup continues, restructurization, sorry, I can't say that word. Please be quiet, they say. The coup continue, and the coup continues. Democracy in the midst of yet another economic crisis, the main goals were reducing the inflation and reactivating um, international relations. The inflation was growing faster than the salaries. Fuga de capitales, social unrest, elections. One dollar, one peso. Pizza, champagne, Ferraris, and European brands, regaining trust from foreign investors and lowering inflation, public spending and privatization of public services, restriction on the emission of currency, inflation go goes down and capitals go up, at least for a while, unemployment rates go up and industry down, unable to compete with import prices, foreign debt, more privatization, corruption, chaos, social unrest. De la Rua, Corralito, chaos, chaos and a helicopter, chaos, five presidents in a day. De la Rua, Puerta Dual, De los Rodriguez Sa, and Kirchner. Poverty is at 57%. Nationalization of public services, cancellation of foreign debt, redistribution of public money, interventionism, fair and conversion, dollar at three, dollar at five, dollar at seven, dollar at 10, dollar at 12, dollar at 15. Inflation, chaos, and social unrest. Conservationism again, dollar at 22, dollar at 25. Droughts in the northwest of the country make the price of the tomato increase by 200%. You now need to work two hours to buy one kilo. Dollar at 28, dollar at 23. Dollar 36, foreign debt, hyperinflation, poverty 33%, consumption falls 4.2% in a month, the peso loses 50% of its value in less than a year, new agreement with the IMF, foreign debt, social and debt unrest, GDP, PBI, deuda externa, privatización, divisas flotantes, intereses, cambio de divisas, convertibilidad, recesión, deuda externa. Al ser, el panel lideró bajo un 0,8%. En línea con los mercados de referencia que anotaron su quinto descenso consecutivo, aceleración inflacionaria, reservas bancarias, déficit fiscal, inflación, tasas anuales en pesos, tasas anuales en dólares, financiamiento, activos externos, activos internos, superávit, reducción de tasas. The dollar is at 40. So let us stop ourselves now, right before the panic. Um, I personally do not have a solution, but I can tell you what is about to happen. And, I will, and you will have to believe me when I tell you. That everything is gonna be okay. Thing is going. 
gonna be okay. The dollar is expected to remain at 40, and the inflation will be over 23%. There will have to be some extreme cuts, but everything is gonna be okay. in social services, 23 in education, 48 in housing, and infrastructure. stay calm. Thank you for coming to the School of Influence. <laughs> Focused on your home c home country, Argentina. Yeah. Um, uh, the scenarios that you uh, selected are not are not that positive. Mm -hmm. But ASMR for you might be the solution for economical language. Yeah, I guess what I've been thinking. Maybe is we should explain a bit what is ASMR. Oh, okay. Um, so ASMR is uh, the triggering of a series of um, feelings uh, through stimuli, very particular stimuli. It can be whispering or tapping, scratching, um, and it helps release endorphins and altogether kind of like relax the person and reduce stress. Uh, so in this case, the scenarios that, are present, that I presented are, are not very uh, positive, but they are not scars. I left a lot of very bad ones out in this case. Uh, and I think in the case of Argentina, it's um, the reception of economic policy and the awareness of um, how close crisis is to us. Um, that makes us very stressed out. So I guess what I was wondering if is, is it possible to experience crisis uh, with less stress and would that allow us to uh, make better decisions in the long term? Yeah, yeah so maybe, uh, I mean, I, I think you can also implement this in, uh, in Turkey. If there's also quite some financial stress about the financial situation here. Uh, I have a, quest, a question for the, are there any Turkish people here in the room? Yes, there are. Do you think that if the economic news will be by whispering and ASMR techniques, that it will be more relaxed to understand them or to take it? Yeah? All right, you understand parts of it, not everything. All right. Well, Mala is is researching if it's. Good question. Good question. All right, maybe the the lady in in the in your at at the back of yours. Hello, lady in pink. Lady in pink. Not responding. Maybe maybe the, the girl there. Um, <laughs> Do you think that uh, the political lead leaders of Turkey, that if they would start whispering, that it, that could have a positive effect on negative news, neg negative financial news? Do you understand the question? Well, I couldn't really hear. <laughs> you couldn't really hear us. All right, I repeat for the last time. Male is um, proposing that if we would turn the negative news 
about financial situations, for example, here in Turkey, uh, through uh, an ASMR technique, that's the whispering technique she just performed, that maybe it will be more, um, uh, less stressful. And maybe it could have a positive effect on the society here if you start whispering all the negative news. <laughs> all right, all right. I think we have to we have to work on the on the on the concept and test it out. Yeah. So far, the audience uh, seems to be a bit far off. Um, thank you very much for listening to School of School of Schools, the radio podcast. I uh, will look forward uh, having you uh, here tomorrow again. Yeah. Yeah. It's at 5 p.m. It's a cool school of individuals tomorrow. Yes, looking forward to it. See you at 5 p.m. Thank you.